It's time to defend our title as the best science and medicine podcast. The podcast award nominations start July 1st, so we need you listeners to get DNA Today nominated at podcastawards.com. DNA Today has won for the past two years, and this September, we are celebrating 10 years of DNA Today. All of this is because of your support, and we are so grateful to have such an incredible listener base, including you. We have been up against popular podcasts with huge production companies, which is why as a small independent podcast, we rely on each and every one of you to get nominated and hopefully win again for the third time. So please go to podcastawards.com and select DNA Today in the science and medicine category. Pause the show now. I swear it takes 30 seconds to do it. Podcastawards.com, DNA Today in the science and medicine category. Thank you oh so much. How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. We're all made of DNA. Hi, you're listening to DNA Today, a podcast and radio show where we discover new advances in the world of genetics. From genetic technology like CRISPR to rare diseases to new research, we have you covered. For a decade, DNA Today has brought you the voices of leaders in genetics. I'm Kira Deneen. I'm a certified genetic counselor and your host. I am so excited to share that our guest for this episode is an actor known for playing Brick Heck on ABC sitcom The Middle from 2009 to 2018. He was also recently on Netflix's Never Have I Ever, created by Mindy Kaling. Welcome to the show, Atticus Schaefer. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a pleasure. I am very excited. Uh, before we started recording, I was just telling Atticus that my family, we grew up watching the middle, like especially when I started high school. Um, so this is just really a treat for me to be able to talk to you. Never never thought, you know, I'd be able to actually interview you. So this is really exciting. This is very exciting for me too. No, and, and being able to talk with you, knowing that you've been doing this for 10 years now, that is huge. Uh, I love the dedication to that. I think that's amazing. We definitely need more things like this, more uh, places to share about topics and, and kind of dive down in a deeper level. So I'm, I'm so blessed to be able to be here and uh, talk with you. Yes, thank you so much. And and speaking of doing something for a decade, you were on the middle for most of your childhood. It was a huge yes. chunk of your childhood. I mean, what was it like to grow up on set, especially working with the same actors for nine years? You know, it, 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 that's such a great question because I think that people, so many times people don't really know what goes on to making a production, right? And um, I, I get all these different people, especially when I was younger, who would be like, well, it's only a half hour show. Uh-uh, but it takes three weeks to make that happen. Plus all the, you know, the pre-production, post-production, like the writers writing and storyboarding and all that other stuff. And plus 250 people working on it, right? And um, growing up, you know, it, it, exactly as you said, pretty much the majority of my childhood and my all my teenage years were spent on the show. And uh, I definitely know that I had a very unique childhood. It had its own difficulties, which which I think are inherent when you start working at a very young age, but, but even more so working in the entertainment industry. And so I had a lot to navigate through. And even now, uh, having been away from the show for about five years now, um, you know, it's, it's very... Uh, I, I say the word obscure for lack of a better word, but I know I know the uniqueness of my childhood and there's parts of it that I would absolutely never change. And there's parts of it now being a little bit older and, and a little bit more of a different perspective looking back on it that go, mm, that could have been different. But uh, but uh, but uh, um, regardless, I'm very proud of the show and what we were able to accomplish in that time. I mean, it's such a fantastic show. And I, I love that you point out how much work goes into each episode because, yes. you know, what I'll binge watch and like, you know, embarrassingly say like last night, I think I watched like four hours of the middle of just, you know, just getting excited for this. So it's like, you know, what I binge through of like how many episodes is that? I can't do math. But when they're 25 right. minutes and you're watching back to back, it's like, wow, that was months of your life that I watched <laughs> one minute, exactly. right? So it's kind of crazy. Absolutely. And, and I was really surprised to learn when I was doing a little bit of research that the pilot was actually filmed twice and it was what, like a year apart or something like that. Yes. And you were the only one from that original cast that people probably have no idea about. I don't even know who was in that original cast, but right. just goes to show how perfectly you were cast. I mean, 
are there similarities between you and Brick with your personalities, your childhood? I mean, a lot of your childhood was playing Brick, so that's a part Absolutely. of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, thank you for those compliments. That is so sweet of you. Um, it, it, it was. That was it, it, it was one of those things where at the time when we did the first pilot, we knew how good the show was, but it just wasn't quite right. Uh, everybody was very into carpoolers that we, we were going up against carpoolers at the time. And I, and I think there was a part of it too, where the model, as we had discussed previously, was like Glee and all these other different shows that were very popular at the time. My name is Earl, um, and, and, and shows like that. And so, uh, when the first pilot didn't go, um, it was one of those situations where it just felt like mm, it's not quite over yet. And so getting the call from the creators of the show, like you said, about a year and a half later, hey, we're, we're getting a second shot, but we can't do it without you. You know, you're, you are brick and we you are to brick. Have you back. <laughs> yes. It's like, it's like, why would I say no to that? Absolutely. I, I, this is amazing. Um, but no, that, the similarities, the reality is, and, and, and I think that this is the, the privilege that an actor gets to have when being on a show for so long is we really get to put more of ourselves into the character and when you're writing 24 episodes for nine years uh the writers have taken inspiration from our lives and even the That's lives so cool. of our crew who worked with us on the show for the majority of that time and um and so yeah really brick was just sort of an outline and i could understand him because i loved his uniqueness and he followed the beat to his own drummer and that's that's really how my mom uh, advised me to live my life is to just be yourself and follow the beat of your own drummer and be knowing of who you are. You can grow in yourself and grow in who you are, but know who you are and, and don't be afraid to be, you know, standing apart from the crowd in that regard. And so I, I really love that about Brick. And then as the years went by, I was the one who really filled in everything from the whooping to the uh, specifics of his mannerisms to, you know, loving flat foot dancing and bluegrass <laughs> music and Legos and history and even the Sergeant McKinsey thing. That was actually something that happened to me in wow. a real Halloween experience that I had had. And my mom shared it with the writers saying, look at what happened to Atticus, just as being fun and, and sharing. And then they took it and turned it into an episode. So, yeah. Yeah, that's really cool when, as you said, when you're playing a character for so long, when it kind of starts bleeding through of your own life into the character and inspiring yeah. into that. And then it's really authentically you, kind of like in that episode Absolutely. in some ways, right? Like, Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and being able to draw from that, I think it makes it that much more fun, you know. How do you like spending the summer? In my free time, I'm usually with friends at our apartment's pool. My spot is right next to the water, reading a book most recently, A Crack in Creation, which might come up on a future episode. I like keeping cool by sipping on some iced tea while I read, but I don't like all the sugar. So I've been enjoying sound drinks instead. Sound makes unsweetened organic sparkling waters made with tea and botanicals, no natural flavors or sugar. My fave is the blueberry with cinnamon and hibiscus tea. Try it out by ordering at drinksound.com using promo code DNA today for 20% off. Again, that's drinksound.com with promo code DNA today for 20% off your order, plus you're supporting the podcast. Speaking of friends in my apartment, a bunch of them have dogs, and I love being able to offer them a treat when I take them for a walk or they visit my place. So I got Sundays for dogs. Now this is dog food, but it can also be used as dog treats. My friend Annie's dog Frank gets so excited when he sees me, and if I'm being honest, I think it's more the food than me. Sundays for Dogs is real food formulated by a vet with high quality meats, veggies, fruits, and superfoods, then air dried to perfection. Since you're a DNA Today listener, you can visit sundaysfordogs.com and use code DNA Today for 35% off your order. Support your pup and the podcast. Perkin Elmer Genomics is a global leader in genetic testing, focusing on rare diseases, inherited disorders, newborn screening, and hereditary cancer. Testing services support the full continuum of care from preconception and prenatal to neonatal, pediatric, and adult. Testing options include sequencing for targeted genes, multiple genes, the whole exome or genome, and copy number variations. Using a simple saliva or blood sample, Perkin Elmer Genomics answers complex genetic questions that can proactively inform patient care and end the diagnostic odyssey for families. Learn more at perkinelmergenomics.com. 
Hemisphere Therapeutics is dedicated to developing therapies that help improve the lives of people with rare genetic diseases. Hemisphere is currently conducting a clinical trial for a potential new treatment for two ultra-rare genetic metabolic diseases called propionic acidemia and methylmalonic acidemia. Learn more about Hemisphere and these ultra-rare metabolic diseases in episode 188 of DNA Today. You can also visit Hemisphere.com. That's H-E-M-O-S-H-E-A-R. And do you have like a favorite episode or scene from the middle? I mean, obviously, like, there's just so many episodes. Right, right. It, it's very hard. For the longest time, especially right when the show ended, my brain was still in the mode of making the show. And so it, w- it was impossible for me to sit there and go, oh, out of all 200 and whatever, how could I pick just one? But actually in time, as I look back and just think on what we did in the show, uh, I have been able to pick a favorite, both a favorite episode and and a, a couple favorite scenes. It's very hard to pick just one. Yes. But favorite episode definitely has to be the block party, and that was way back in season one. And I feel like that was the episode where we were finally able to get to know Brick. He wasn't just the kid anymore. Now we understood why and how he does things. And to be able to learn that about him and and see who he is and really begin to see the depth of how he thinks, I think that was a very special moment for the family as a whole. And being able to have that be witnessed through the eyes of, of Mike, uh, Neil Flynn's character, I think was just so perfect. It was such a perfect dynamic. Yeah, with and, the dad and also, on the show. Yep. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then having that dynamic of him learning to accept his son and who his son is. I think that was very special. Is that the but one where fi- you were like, quote, like someone would say, oh, on this page, what is like the top left line say? And you like were able to like, recite it from like the it was lawnmower the one manual. Working... Yes, the yes. lawnmower yeah, manual. That yes, one. Yes, yeah, that, that one. Yeah, that was very yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. I really it liked was, that it one. It was so precious. But for a favorite scene, you know, there's a, there, unfortunately, there's a scene that was cut from the show. Oh. And it was a scene in season nine. Now, there, there, whenever you're working with a lot of different people, there's always going to be politics involved. And it's incredibly unfortunate because I think that it, it was a situation that really robbed the show from having a beautiful crescendo moment, even though it was very early on in the season. And uh, it, w- it was the scene where, where in the episode, in, I believe it was season nine, where Sue is uh, coming in to save Brick from being locked up in that detention mm-hmm. cage. And this was right after he had broken up with Cindy for a period mm-hmm. of time and all that other stuff. There was a scene where it was just him and the principal. And it was another one of those brilliant moments where it was seeing Brick becoming an adult and expressing himself. And just kind of being fed up with people trying to make him something he's not. And I think that it really would have resonated with people. And that is probably the scene in the entirety of the show I worked on the most. Wow. I was working on that scene wanting to to get the emotion right, the performance and everything for weeks. Uh, you know, as practically as soon as I got the script in my hand for that scene, I was working on it. And then working with a director the day of, I mean, we took probably half the day to make that scene happen. Um, and not because, again, it, there was anything wrong with what was being done. It, we wanted it to be that perfect because we knew the depth of the scene. And then, of course, the executive producer just, this, it, her excuse was it was too good. And then just cut cut the scene from the show. You're there like, was thanks other... for the compliment for, like, the acting right. ability. But, like, right. I would like to see that in there. Especially yeah. as a sitcom, I think, to have those moments where yes. something is very deep. And, and I think we see Brick's character in, like, season, end of season two, early season three of, like, you know, Mike, the dad, like pushing, like you need to advocate for yourself. Like, I feel like that's first where we see yes. more character development. So like Absolutely. full circle is, is the youngest kid out of the three to see Brick, like really establish that in the last season of, of being an adult. Absolutely. And, and I think the one thing that did partially make up for that. And, and so therefore it has become my new favorite scene is the flash forward of Brick. Um, and spoiler alert to anybody who hasn't <laughs> seen it, but when he becomes an author as an adult, Um, That is probably one of the only scenes that I had a very heavy influence in how it went in the show. And I'm very blessed by that. Um, I, I, I pitched in originally there was one shot of the kid coming up to Brick and it was just the back of my head. Brick never spoke and the kid didn't hardly say anything at all. It was just an establishing shot that Brick is an author with the voiceover and that's it. But I had pitched with the director to Eileen, who is the executive producer of the show. Hey, 
I can change my voice and sound like an adult because I am one at this point. I was like right. 19. Um, you know, let me let me have a line and Tyson, our makeup guy, can do anything. Stick a beard on him. And then I even was able to have the Easter egg put in of Brick having his wedding ring on because oh, he and wow. Cindy are married. Right. And so that was that's probably my favorite scene now uh, because it was a great way of being able to finish out the character and kind of have him be be completed, you know, in yes. that in that beautiful he he ended up all right and he did his thing like Frankie always said he would. So. Right. <laughs> and I think a lot of your fans may not realize that you have a genetic disorder because they don't yes. remember that explicitly ever coming up for for Brick um, right. in terms of that you know being defined or, or part of his character. Um, but can you share a little bit about osteogenesis imperfecta? Absolutely. So, um, exactly as you said, it's a genetic uh, it, it's a genetic bone condition, but it essentially affects the collagen in my body. Uh, osteogenesis imperfecta is is a very big Latin word that literally says what it translates to, to from Latin to English. It's imperfect bones. Um, so the collagen in my body and the structure of my body is a little bit different. Uh, the slang for it is brittle bone disease. So in my life, I have had a lot of fractures. Uh, I've had to have a lot of corrective surgeries. I have a lot of metal hardware, uh, specifically in my in my legs. So TSA loves me. Um, <laughs> yes. But uh, but uh, but yeah, no, I've had a lot of difficulties in my life, and um, this is a genetic condition that um, I know we're going to get in more to this in depth as as we continue to talk. But my mom does have it. Uh, her mother has it. My brother has it. Um, and again, all varying types and degrees, uh, but uh, his kids don't have it, believe it or not. And then my, my mom has two siblings, and they did not have it either. So it's a very weird um, condition that is, is, it's known a little bit more now, but it, 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 it really is still not widely known, and it, it wasn't when I was growing up. And uh, it, it's funny because you even brought it up that it's, it, Brick did not have OI. Brick was just a, you know, a quirky kid. But I remember specifically in season one when we were finishing up the show and we were starting to do the publicity to publicize the show, um, Eileen had come up to my mom and explicitly said, don't talk about Atticus's condition ever. Uh, you know, act act like he's normal and, um, you That's know, let them... That's a powerful thing to say to someone, like a, a, I know. a parent of a child with a genetic disorder. I know. And that was something that I think I, we, we adhered to for a brief period of time but then my mom and I both realized, you know, I'm given this platform that can be used for good. And it should be where we encourage other people with this platform. And whether that be with genetic conditions, physical, you know, difficulties, mental difficulties, even just emotional difficulties, because those kind of go hand in hand when you have physical ones. Um, I think that it was really important. And, and right around season three, we really just said, you know what? No, let's 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 be real, be open and honest, but have the right uh, environment to do it, and yeah. we did. So. And and such a great thing, and just thank you on behalf of the community for being someone that is comfortable and speaking out and being a patient advocate. I think there's thank just you. so much that is added to the community when we have people that have conditions that can speak about their experiences and you know be able to inspire others. When it came to your journey. Um, when were you diagnosed with OI? Was it early in childhood? It sounds like, I mean, you said by, you know, season three, you were already advocating. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I, I, uh, so my mom, when she, uh, you know, grew up, uh, she was aware that she had OI. Her mom, who also had OI, was never diagnosed. And they actually just told her mom that she, I believe it was rickets. They okay. just said, oh, well, you have rickets. Your bones are just more fragile. You need to eat this. You'll be fine. And my grandmother worked in a factory. She worked in the Lockheed factory just fine. She would complain of back pain, but that's about it, right? And then my mom, you know, she was never formally diagnosed either by a test, but she had a doctor who essentially said, oh, well, you have a Y. This is why you break and you, you dislocate. Um, but you, at that time, there was only two types. There was type 1, which is you have it. There's type 2, which is you had it and you died in childbirth. Uh, meaning, meaning when you're born, you're deceased. Um, and so she was typed as a type one. Now, when I came along, then it became four types and I got typed via skin graph at NIH, okay. National Institute of Health. And, uh, they told me that I was a type four, which that 
alone kind of blew my mom away because she was told that she would never have a type worse than what she was and she's a type one so type one is a little bit more mild and type four is more severe um now you know when you go through the typing of oi a, a few years ago back when i was still on the show they said that there were eight types and now they're not typing anymore by those eight because those eight they found had subtypes so there's it's essentially countless now yeah uh, of the of the variations of OI that can be had. And you have people that get the mutations, no one else in their family has it, and all this other stuff. And so it, it really is interesting to see, because if you were to look at me, uh, you know, my skeletal structure is a little bit different, and I'm more of a hobbit, as I say, because I'm on the shoulder I side. I watched that video recently, and I was like, this is comedic <laughs> genius. I was just Thank like, you. this is hilarious. I um, appreciate yes. that. Thank you. But no, you we'll link to me. that in the show notes so people can enjoy that. <laughs> Perfect. I love that. No, but you look at me, and I look like a hobbit. Now, definitely, there's something different about me. Now, you look at my brother, he looks like he's part of a biker gang. I mean, he's 5'8 and 200 pounds, and he's a big boy and doesn't have any of the, any of the issues. If you look really close you can see some scars from previous surgeries but that's about it right so and and i had attended an oi conference once and uh, I, I my mom and i both had the pleasure of actually being able to speak at it and when we did that was huge because now you see a whole menagerie of all these different types like of people with the OI. spectrum i would imagine absolutely probably there absolutely you get you get these people who are incredibly tiny with the barrel chesting and and incredibly blue sclera and it's like okay that's that type and then you get people that look like they're completely normal it's like wait you have a lie i would never guess that and then you get the people that are the variations of each you know so it's it's really fascinating yeah it definitely is and and just how much things have changed in terms of how we categorize and with the different types and now it's right. like all right we're moving away from that it seems like and more just describing it because for a lot of the types it can go from mild to severe like including type right. four which you were like originally diagnosed with and um you know around the time of your diagnosis there was a doctor who warned your mother you'd probably be using a wheelchair to be mobile which didn't end up right. happening if i'm correct right. um how do you wish and, and from hearing from your mom over the years how do you wish that this doctor and other doctors would approach this conversation in terms of providing information on oi and, and having a, a balanced structure to this conversation and not having blanket statements like that you know, that is such an excellent question, and um, I, I, I want to be fair. That We always, so many times nowadays, people are not necessarily fair and look on the other side of the fence. So to to preface my answer and, and actually to give more insight onto that story, let me just say that, admittedly, they have to be in possession of information in order to tell it more eloquently. I'll start with that. But diving in deeper to that story, you know, when when I came out, I admittedly, being my parent, was an absolute nightmare for my mom. I am saying that, not, not her. Uh, but it's because she's now in possession of this child who she adores, but is in constant pain. And there were times where she would lift me up and I would break. That's how severe my OI was. And so, you know... Her thinking, which is exactly how my thinking is now, is we need to fix the problem. I want my child to be pain-free and to be functioning. And when we we didn't have resources of OI knowledgeable doctors to actually assist me as a ped, as an infant, and then go up from there. And so we, she was just starting at square one, which is what is my biological father's insurance, and go and and start there and that was where we had this doctor who uh was manipulating my legs and i'm screaming on a table because he's breaking me as he's manipulating me and uh my mom is saying stop because you're hurting my child i need you to help my child and then he turned around and essentially tried to bite my head off or my mom's head off verbally with mrs schaefer you need to get a grip on the fact that your child is going to be in a wheelchair the rest of his life and that is so not true, number one. I mean, like you said, that's a blanket statement that is unfair. Number two, uh, my mom went into full-fledged mama bear mode and proved him wrong, which I am so grateful for. Um, and through a long course of events, you know, we, we were finally very blessed uh, by God to be able to find the doctors that I needed to see to get me the help that I needed. And eventually, and it went from, I'm not in pain anymore, to now I can scoot, to now I can crawl, to now I can walk, which I didn't walk until I was six years old. 
Um, and, and so to, but to directly answer your question, even now my mom is having to deal with medical doctors who are supposed to just be focused in one area. And yet they're, it's almost, she, she references it as like, they're cursing her with these blanket statements that are uneducated and unfair. And I really think that, uh, doctors who want to, whether they're addressing OI or really any genetic disorder, the reality is every human being is different. Our DNA are different. Our, we all our... have mutations, right? Like I, yeah, average, we each have like 12 or something around there. Absolutely. Absolutely. But that's exactly it. You know, we are each unique people. And I think that doctors need to go in with the understanding of let's treat the patient and the problems that they are specifically facing, not just, well, the report says this. Yes, you need to research. Of course you need to research and see where there's constants and whatever, because that's how we grow in knowledge in the medical field. But also understand you're still dealing with a human. And if you are a doctor who is in one area, don't try to be an expert in another area and make statements about that. Like That's why referrals exam. exist, right? <laughs> That's it. Yes. But but even 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 so, you know, um, just because you work with someone doesn't mean that they're the best. And that's another huge thing. So we, we actually began to see a geneticist. I won't name names, but we, we began to see a geneticist in our health system now who uh, we actually thought was an orthopedic doctor because of the way that she was carrying herself. And she wasn't. She's just a geneticist. And she referred us to a, a spine doctor who, uh, because my mom has an injury in her back, and so we needed to have some insight on this and this occurred last year and this spine doctor essentially had one answer for everything which is to do a a scoliosis surgery my mother and i both have scoliosis and we've been living with scoliosis our whole life when you have oi if you understand the depth of what a scoliosis surgery is you don't want to do a scoliosis surgery on a patient with oi because it will fail and this in terms of like the bones being able to heal for themselves, is that one of correct. the factors? Correct. And okay. keeping those anchors in that keep the rod in place, etc. It's not a long bone where you're just sticking a rod into a long bone. This is different. And if this goes wrong, this can paralyze somebody, right? Because you're talking about a, a critical area of the body. And this person's answer was essentially for anything, oh, well, you need to just rod it and that's it. He wasn't going in deeper with all the different aspects of a neurosurgery or, or a spinal surgery. My mother went outside of the system because, again, this was supposedly the expert on OI for this particular person's referral, who was referring, I should say. And we went outside the system, saw two other neurosurgeons, and learned, no, don't you don't want to. The answer is not to rod the back. And Here's that's so scary because you could have just, your mom could have been like, okay, this is what you're telling me, go for the surgery, yes. and then had major problems from that, including paralysis. Absolutely. And that's, and that's the depth of it. And you just hit the nail on the head here. And I think that any doctors who do listen to, you know, this podcast or, or hear this information, they need to understand you might be okay. You might be a healthy human being, but you're dealing with someone who isn't. And you need to take, you need to not only respect that, but you also need to not abandon someone in that. Uh, my mom, she's a person with a Y, and she runs a homestead here. We live on a homestead. She's working with chickens, walking up our acre of property, and she's a high-functioning person despite having a Y. So, again, they need to keep that in mind and not give up a person to their age or to their condition, but rather be open. You know, it's time to do research and learn things, learn new things, and, and do what you're supposed to do as a doctor and try to help that patient. And if you can't, admit that you can't and try to get them to who can't i think that's that's the the way to have a successful medical system is to actually work to try to fix a patient and not just well we could do this and it might be a band-aid yeah all about personalized medicine i think there's been yes. a, a big shift in this like since 2019 since the middle started of Absolutely. like looking at okay let's look at all this data but see what fits for this patient and, yes. and then apply it to that patient. Absolutely. Um, and certainly with like, as we have been talking about, like even with like genetic testing for people that are diagnosed in that way, um, you know, looking at, okay, well for this mutation, this is what's gonna work, you know, related yes. to that. Um, Absolutely. So I think that's, that's a big piece. And I mean, you've already provided, I think so much insight and advice for people in the community, but do you have any other advice for kids or other people with OI or other disorders um, that include short stature? 
You know, absolutely. And and this is kind of the part where, uh, again, uh, I'm speaking as me and uh, and I'm grateful that you're giving me the opportunity to speak as me. Um, but, you know, it, it, we live in a world that has all different types of people. And, and unfortunately, there is there are people who are ignorant to what it's like to have a condition like this and to view and interact with a small person. And there's people that are not and they're more empathetic and they're more compassionate and understanding and can understand this is just a person, even though they look differently from me. And um, a big thing that I've had, especially when it comes to the short stature, you get a lot of people that try to what I call kidify you. Uh, they try to make you out to be, you know, younger than you are or stupid or, you know, uneducated or whatever. And that's very unfortunate, but it's real. And um, you are going to have to go through your life really being your own advocate. Plain and simple. Uh, I've kind of accepted the, fight, the, the, the fact that in my life I have had and will continue to have to be a fighter and have that warrior spirit. Uh, if, if I don't champion myself, no one else will. And so you do need to kind of take that on with acceptance. And, and, you know, when you go through your teenage years, there is a little bit of that where you can get angry. And my mom conveys to me all the time where growing up, when she would see other people with a Y, there's a lot of them that can get very angry. And that's a lot of depression. That's a lot of, um, you know, anxiety, especially with, with when you have something where you can literally get harm done to you for the simplest things. And so I've, I've definitely felt that, I've experienced that, but it's not something to live in. And the sooner that you can just have that self-confidence of knowing who you are, and while there are things that are within your control that you can grow in for yourself and better yourself, um, understanding that there are just some people who won't understand and that's fine, and you don't need to take on what they are trying to inflict upon you, that's key. And then, but the biggest overall thing, and this is for me, is my faith. I'm a Christian, and uh, the Bible is all about saying, I made you the way I wanted you to be made. There's nothing, air quote, wrong with you. It's that you are who I made you to be, speaking as if it was God. And so my faith is very important to me, and, in, and the more I grow in my faith, the more confidence I'm able to have in myself. I am getting a new body when this is all over, and I'm, I am eventually going to know what it's like to be pain-free and without a why, and that's wonderful. But in the meantime, I've been given this challenge, and it has only been used to make me stronger as a person, as a man, and I love that because now it's taken this thing that could absolutely go haywire and be negative, and it's been turned into a positive. And even more so because I've been blessed with a platform, not only in the acting world, but in what I do now with the content creation business, where I can communicate with people who have all sorts of different challenges and can be someone that can be an encouragement to them and say, look, don't let your challenges define you. Work within your limitations, which admittedly, we all have limitations, whether you have a genetic condition or not, but you can work within them. And when you work within them, you can thrive. And that's so beautiful to be able to do and find out for yourself. And now, to me, life is an adventure. Okay, I can't do these things, and that really stinks because it kind of hurt finding out I, I can't do these things. But now I know I can do these things, and now I can just focus my energy on that. And now it's positive. Well, that is just so. beautifully said. I think that's just so <laughs> inspirational. And I'm just so glad that you are someone in the community for people to look to, especially kids. I think that's something that, yes. you know, growing up, we want to see in the media that there's someone like us out there. Um, yes. And especially someone like, you know, you playing Brick, someone as fun as Brick and just so quirky <laughs> and so great. I mean, to me, you carried the show. Like, I, you know, Thank just you. from my perspective, you know, just <laughs> so many great things, like the whispering, just everything. It's just yes. such a unique character. <laughs> Hemashir Therapeutics is dedicated to developing therapies that help improve the lives of patients with rare genetic diseases. Hemashir scientists have developed an investigational therapy to treat methylmalonic acidemia and propionic acidemia. These ultra-rare genetic diseases lead to the rapid buildup of toxins in the body. Patients can suffer from intellectual disability, liver, kidney, or cardiac disease, and other life-threatening conditions. Hemashir is conducting a clinical trial to assess if their drug may be effective in the treatment of both methylmalonic acidemia and propionic acidemia. Learn more about Hemashir and these ultra-rare metabolic diseases in episode 188 of DNA Today. You can also visit Hemashir.com. That's H-E-M-O-S-H-E-A-R.com. 
Did you know Perkin Elmer Genomics was one of the first laboratories to offer whole genome sequencing on a clinical basis? Whole genome sequencing can maximize clinical diagnostic yield for patients. With turnaround time of four weeks for the proband sample, Perkin Elmer's whole genome sequencing test is designed to provide access to additional valuable information compared to an exome. Perkin Elmer also offers prenatal whole genome sequencing as well as ultra-rapid whole genome sequencing for critically ill newborns using dried blood spots. The ultra-rapid genome has a turnaround time of five days and includes mito, chromosomal CNV analysis, STR-TNR screening, and biochemical analysis. Also, listen back to episode 176 with Dr. Maduri Hegda, where we explore the power of whole genome sequencing, which also happens to be one of my favorite episodes of DNA Today. And stay tuned for a couple more episodes with Perkin Elmer soon. Discover all that Perkin Elmer Genomics has to offer at perkinelmergenomics.com. And, and as you were mentioning, um, since 2019, you've been very active on YouTube and Twitch yes. um, under Atticus Schaefer Vlog. What games do you stream on there? So I, I love variety, and that's what I really, I think that's where I found my success is is taking my channels and kind of making them into a variety show. So we kind of do different things all the time. Uh, I'm definitely a typical guy. I love my action stuff. So, you know, games like Escape from Tarkov and Days Gone, you know, slaying some zombies. Uh, but even stuff like Minecraft and silly things like that. I, there, was a, there was a game that we played that was called Death Road to Canada. And it's a little, <laughs> like, pixelated zombie game, but Canada is safe so you're going from florida to canada and uh even in that i was able to take members of my community and make them into characters who would assist me in the game oh that's so fun you know we, <laughs> we do a whole bunch of different stuff on the channel and so we have a ton of fun uh recently i've gotten into poppy playtime because i have a friend of mine who recommended it with to me and apparently people love watching me get terrified uh so <laughs> That's fun for those people, and then I love. Uh, I really love this game recently called Hunt Showdown. It's kind of a period piece, but Ooh. same thing. You're fighting like these monsters and zombies and stuff like that, but you're like a cowboy bounty hunter in the early 1900s. So it scratches my history nerd itch. Uh, but yeah, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I stream three times a week on Twitch every Monday, Thursday, and Saturday. And then on YouTube, I do videos all the time, uh, mostly humorous based. But of course, I have some serious talks in there too. So yeah. Yeah, fantastic. We're definitely going to put a link to the show notes if people want to go right there right now, though. It's Atticus yes. Schaefer, V L O G. Um, and I have to ask before we end. So yes. I was watching Never Have I Ever because Mindy Kaling, just anything she creates is just, I know I'm going to love. <laughs> um, so I never even question. I don't look what it's about. I'm just like, go, let's, let's watch this. Um, yes. and then I was like, oh my gosh, it's Atticus Schaefer. Like I didn't expect it to be in the show. And I was like, wow, yes. look at this. How, how was it? Did you end up working with Mindy at all? Or were you with the I, other I actors? I wish I did. Okay, I really yeah. wish I did because, uh, I, I love The Office. So, I mean, she oh, was I legendary know, right? in that. And that was like... <laughs> Look, I'm so close to the office cast now. And right. it's actually and we funny because we were too yeah. young when it was airing, I think, to I watch it. So it's like I we know. were yeah. part of that like rewatch it on whatever yes. platform it's on at the time. <laughs> yes. yes, exactly. Because it keeps changing, right? I just I got the DVD set and now I Same. hang on to that. Like, I know, I just bought them because I'm like, I can't nice. keep switching around. But anyway, no. how, how no. was it to be on the set and, and be in that Absolutely. episode? Absolutely. Oh, it was so terrific. You know, she even though she I never had the chance of actually meeting her, she hires excellent people she really everybody does. from the director down to production assistants were the most lovely people that i've had the chance of being able to work with in the industry i absolutely adored it and actually fun fact is uh uh the we had a pa on the middle uh who he left the show because he had a passion to pursue being a stunt guy and he became a stunt guy and he was a good friend of mine and actually i got him to be the job of the waiter who stops me when i'm stealing the liquor oh, in really? ever. so that's actually a buddy of mine from the middle wow. as well and so it was really cool i was able to work with some old friends again but also meet a ton of very amazingly talented new people the cast the actors were so lovely so real and it was such a fun time. I I, 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 I I know that they did season two. I don't know if they have announced a season three yet. I know. I was just going to ask you. Back. I was like, I haven't seen a season three announced, no. but I'm not as on it. You know, like I, would, I, would love to, I would love to be back, though. If they had me back, it would be an absolute pleasure. But if not, I made my little splash into yes. that Well, if Mindy Kaling's listening, so cool. Atticus is ready to come Please. back. So. <laughs> 
<laughs> Mindy, bring me back, please. And You're so that you'll get to fun. meet. So like when she's on yes. set at some point. Yes. yes. Yeah, exactly. But they were they were so much fun. And I think that's so cool that you're able to bring that up and, and share that. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, check out Never yeah. Have I Ever on Netflix. It yeah. was fun. It is a fantastic show. And and anything else on the horizon other than, I mean, you're really busy on Twitch and YouTube. But have Absolutely. you packed anything else into your schedule that, you're, that you can publicly share? I tried share? to. Let me tell you, I tried to. I'm auditioning all the time for stuff, awesome. um, and uh, and uh, I actually am in the the, the Discovery Plus show, um, Inventions That Changed History. Oh. I got to be a little all right. So you're a history expert. nerd, like you got to yes. like really itch that. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh yeah. No, I got to I got to talk about some pretty cool stuff that I I'm I'm fairly knowledgeable on, and then I got to learn a few things too. So that was fun. So definitely check that out. Um, awesome. I've also been in in quite a few little voiceover things, and I am working on a couple different animation shows now uh which i'm very excited about what i always tell people and i never thought of this before but it's so hard to talk about things when you're in the industry because you know you get the ndas and yep. you never know especially if you're not on it um like like you had said like you know when things get announced you don't quite know when you can talk about something but the best thing for people to do go check out imdb.com yes stands for the internet movie database and search my name because they can only put something on imdb if it's been announced and it's announced that i'm a part of it so if you're curious about what i'm doing and again it's something that that's the best way for me to talk about it or no i can't talk about right, it right that you can just log on before an interview and be like can i talk about this yet <laughs> yeah exactly all right let me see here oh that's been announced okay yeah. uh but yeah no no definitely check that out that's the best way to stay up to date on on what i'm doing acting wise now I'll say it here first. I'm not quite sure what your what your lapse is between recording. We'll have a little bit of time, so I think you'll okay, be good. But I I am going to be pursuing directing very Ooh, heavily. That is very uh, exciting, Atticus. Wow. I've had a, I've had a huge passion for directing, and actually, I had the pleasure of going through the Warner Brothers Directors Workshop um, uh, in between the last two seasons of The Middle. And I essentially got a letter of recommendation from the teacher of that class, who's a director by the name of Bethany Rooney. And it was such an amazing experience. Imagine film school condensed down to nine weeks. That's pretty wow. much what it was. And uh, she was so encouraging to me and essentially saying, you know, this is what you're supposed to do. I, you're, the acting is great, but you were born to be a director. And I had never had anybody tell me that before in my life. And so I'm, I'm going to be reaching out to my agent and really just saying, this is a passion. How can we get this going? So Amazing. for the listeners, please be on the lookout for that. And also yes. please, you know, keep your fingers crossed for me because I'm very excited about this. We definitely will. And I mean, you're, you're young. I mean, I'm young too, but you know, <laughs> yeah, you're young. So you have a long future ahead of you. So I think we're just going to, you know, see you do so much. And I just want to thank you again for coming on the show and just being Absolutely. so open. I just really appreciate that. And I'm sure the listeners do as well, just to learn about, you know, the insider view on, on your life and all aspects with the acting future directing um, and you. just living with OI. I think it's just really powerful to hear directly from people that have these experiences. I greatly, greatly appreciate that. Listen, you have a friend in me and Amazing. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would most certainly love to come back. Hopefully I'll have yes. some other projects to be able to share and, and be able to talk about this more. But seriously, thank you for having me on. This was truly a pleasure. Yeah, fantastic. And yeah, let us know when your you know director debut is so we can totally we'll promote it. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll awesome. do. Awesome. Don't forget to help us defend our title as the best science and medicine podcast. Go to podcastawards.com and select DNA Today in the science and medicine category. And here's a bonus. If you tweet or post that you nominated DNA Today and, of course, tag us, then we will share your post and give you a shout out on the show as a thank you. Again, that's podcastawards.com, DNA Today for the science and medicine category. You have the power to get DNA Today nominated again. So please go nominate us. I'm begging you. Podcastawards.com. For more information about today's episode, visit dnapodcast.com, where you can also stream all episodes of the show. We encourage your questions, comments, guest pitches, and ideas. Send them all into info at dnapodcast.com. Search DNA Today on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, so you can connect with us there. And a favor, please rate and review the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. This truly helps us climb the charts and allow more genetic nerds like yourself to find the show. DNA Today is hosted and produced by myself, Kier Deneen. Our social media lead is Corinne Merlino. Our video lead is Amanda Andrioli. 
Thanks for listening and join us next time to discover new advances in the world of genetics. The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, are all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA.